Um, from your right to left, or my right to left, we have Aaron Paul Lowe, who's a composer. I'll check the clip notes. Studied Arizona State Manhattan School of Music. He's a professional composer for over a decade. You've worked on music that's appeared in the Olympics, the World Cup, Super Bowls, yeah. Tribeca and Sundance Film Festivals, and TV shows such as Project Runway. That's Aaron and Paul Lowe. To his left is probably someone who's not a stranger to you. You've probably seen him lurking in the hallways. This is Taiwan, Mr. Fingers Green, former and current occasionally student at Queensborough Community College. But what you may or may not know about Taiwan Green, he's actually a pretty heavy producer guy. He's worked with people like Jay Z. He's worked with uh, he did Ja Rule's Hala Hala. He's done uh, what, what film was it? Fast uh, and Furious. Fast and Furious soundtrack. Uh, Ernie Jackson. Yeah, that too. Of Ernie Jackson. Uh, uh, Mariah Carey. Uh, I can keep going on. Everybody. <laughs> he's worked with everybody. That's Taiwan Green. <laughs> Certainly not least, we have Eric Brown, who um, you're from Alaska. Mm. You've been in NYC since 2007, musician, producer, and studio owner. Mm. Uh, career highlights include being on Conan O'Brien as a lookalike. I saw that. <laughs> you, you Take the glasses there? off and put the hair up. It's, yeah. it's like, oh, I see right? it. I see it. <laughs> you were drumming for Jay Z at the Super Bowl. That's not so bad. Uh, now works in audio, video, live sound, both on location and in the studio. That's Eric. That's friends. That's right. The first question I wanted to ask to open it up was how you got your start. I'll just throw it, um, throw it straight down the line. We had already been talking about this, but yeah, we talked a little bit. Uh, yeah, my, my start really comes, uh, I, I fell into composing by complete accident, but um, the real, uh, the meat and potatoes of how I got my start was when I was during my graduate degree, I asked uh, one of the teachers that I was studying with, who well, I knew had some connections, I just said straight up, give me anything you got, send me to someone, um, anyone who needs, you know, an intern or whatever, she sent me to a guy who um, was running a studio called Sacred Noise. Uh, this is about 2005. And um, I sat down and I said, hey, I'm a student of, of this woman, Julia Wolf. He's like, oh, I love her. Uh, when can you start? So that's, I guess that's the first lesson there is name drop. But uh, but I, I, I just, uh, I took out the trash. I uh, made coffee. I filed CDs. Uh, and they gave me a $50 a week stipend for lunch money. Um, and I did that for over a year. And then, you know, eventually, and they would give me little bits and pieces to work on. Like, I would do studio time at night, and it was cool, you know, I would be in the session, I would work the, the console, I would learn what they were doing, sometimes they would actually give me gigs, and be like, I worked on a Lunesta spot, uh, which, uh, that was the early days drug ads, um, and so, I got to write on this stuff, and I would win on occasion. And they wouldn't pay me, like, the full, you know, composer fee, but they would give me a taste, and it was enough to live on. Uh, I mean, it was like four of us in a one-bedroom apartment in Harlem, actually, so, uh, you know. Uh, but, you know, I kept on building up a reel, and eventually, um, you know, when I went off on my own, I had a pretty robust reel. I stole some clients from them. I built up my own thing, and, and the rest is history. Um, the start here, actually, in Queensboro. Um, I met this one kid. I was playing keyboard, and he also played... And he was like, you really need to come to my house and you need to um, work on your production. And I didn't even know what a music producer was at the time. And he explained to me, he was another student here, but he explained to me what a music producer was. I came to his house, got the bug, and then I got my own equipment years later. And this is around 96, I got my own equipment. Well, 98, I got my own equipment. I got NPC keyboard, and I started making beats. And what I thought would be the best thing for me to do was go to where everybody congregates at, which is the barbershops in, in our community. So I went to, the, I went to all the barbershops and played my music. Everybody is a, a rapper that's a barber, or everybody is a rapper that's in the yeah. barbershop. So that's how I got a buzz for myself. Then I got this big buzz around New York. People kept hearing about this musician that plays and makes beats. And then I got a meeting with Earth Gotti. Um, he told me that he didn't like any of my music when I first played it for him, which I was a damn lie. But, <laughs> but he had to play that off. And he said, hey, if you play all these instruments and uh, my friend little Rob likes you, then I'll sign you to my production company. I went to um, Rob's house. 
and it was happened to be a friend that I taught how to produce. <laughs> so, so he's like, so I got to the guy's house. He's like, wait, fingers? That's fingers? Because he knew me from my real name, Taiwan. He's like, well, if, if that's fingers, you got you sign him because he taught me. And that's how I got down with Murray Inc. And then next week I'm on a plane watching Jay Z and DMX perform songs on stage. And then I'm producing Holla Holla the next week. So that's how, that's how fast things go. When did you get your stuff? Uh, let's see. Got a guitar when I was 12. Was in a studio with my crappy high school grunge band by 14. And I was like, ah, oh, the studio stuff's cool. And then, you know, that's 16, 17 years ago, I've been buying studio stuff. <laughs> I got the bug early on. And then when I was like a senior in high school, I rented out a spot above an auto shop for 600 bucks a month. And I had my, my studio. And, you know, I had to work around my high school schedule and the auto shop's noise making schedule. But at night, they didn't care. I could make as much noise as I wanted to. So I'm like 17, 18, 19, kind of have recorded every band in Anchorage, Alaska for 30 bucks an hour or whatever, 25 bucks, you know, enough to make my $600 a month rent and buy some soda or something. <laughs> no, I wasn't, I wasn't too hardcore. <clears throat> and then I uh, got in a touring band and I basically spent the next four years dropping out of college and signing up for college again and dropping out of college. Sounds familiar. Up again. Sounds familiar. So I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna go on tour instead. And then I came, I was in college for like music production in Denver. And my friend was like, come visit me in New York. And I was like, okay, I've never been to New York. So I came here, and I was supposed to come for two days, and I stayed for two weeks and dropped out of college again. And then I was like, all right, I gotta move to New York, I gotta figure this out. And so I applied to NYU's uh, Clive Davis department, it's like a music production program at NYU. And NYU wholeheartedly rejected me because I was just like had straight Fs. But Clive Davis accepted me, that department did because I had a good portfolio. Because I've been doing stuff and I was creative. So they worked something out where I got let in on academic probation. So I had wow. to keep a B, a B average the rest of college, which is super hard for me because I'm a terrible student. But I like, you know, I'm always busy, but I just like have a hard time in the class structure. But I did it, and I finally finished. And then uh, I did one year of grad school, and then I quit because <laughs> I was just like, you know, what? I want to be done. I want to be doing my my production stuff and music, and and so that's I finally finished school in 20. 11. So the last like, five years I've just been like hitting it hard just to a production and building a studio and trying to build a career. So. What, so you started off in an established studio. You mm -hmm. actually started your own studio and you basically started your own studio like, working in those studios. Is that a viable thing nowadays that you would expect to, and maybe this is not a good question for you, but you feel free to answer. Is that a viable thing nowadays to expect to be able to go in and intern in a studio in your line of work, let's say, in advertising? Uh, there's less companies now in that are pure music houses, but there's just as much production as ever. Like, post-production is still, I mean, there's no less than there was 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, the everyone likes free work. <laughs> I mean, they were paying me out of petty cash, so they didn't consider me to be an employee or anything. So yeah, I don't see why you couldn't do that now. I mean, you just, it's getting in the door and, and it's its proven to them that you're, you know, worth them taking you on and, uh, and uh, that's about it. So in a post-production house, you're talking about a TV advertising focused post-production. Yeah, or, or like, um, I mean, I have a lot of friends that went into companies that did like, uh, either sound design or mixing for films. Uh, a friend of mine was a, a, did sound design at uh, NYU, and she got an internship at a company that, uh, I think they're called Hobo Audio, and they just specialized in doing posts on, uh, on local TV shows and stuff, uh, things that were filmed in New York, would mix in New York, and you know they hired her straight from it because she knew the equipment, she was good with Pro Tools, and they liked her, so. You know. I would say that, of course, it's a little bit more difficult to get an internship at one of the major studios because a lot of them went out of business. I mean, some of my favorite studios that I worked at went out of business, like Hit Factory. They, they had actually on 54th Street, there was two Hit Factories. There was the old Hit Factory where Stephen Wonder made the songs of your life. Then down the block, closer to 10th Avenue, they had the new Hit Factory, which you would walk in there and you just felt like, I made it. And, and, and I mean, like, they had a big freight elevator that took you up to the sixth floor where they had this huge room where the band could play, you know, fit a whole two orchestras in there. They had three grand pianos. I mean, I used to love this room. You could play football in there. 
Mm. Like, wow. it was huge. And that's gone. I mean, they, and they used to have the Michael Jackson entrance, where it was a back, he would drop under the ground and come through the back elevator, and there's a whole panel that you have to move over, actually seeing the elevator. Wow. It was it's crazy. So, I mean, those days are gone because Hit Factory is gone. Both of those are gone. Sony Studio that was across the street from Hit Factory, that's gone. They, like, wiped out the whole building. Mm. And I mean, a lot, like one of the few studios that's still alive is Quad, but it's not even the same because um, uh, the sixth floor is not, it's called Premier Studios now, so they separated all these different studios out of the building. So long story short, can you get an internship? Yes, but here's how I would approach it. I would look for viable producers because viable producers always have like their small setup in their house or they might have a little um, like similar situation where they're renting a small, small space somewhere, a storefront. Align yourself with different producers because they always want people to mix their music because they're not engineers, most producers. So you, I would go go that way, and then you can find some mixes that way from dealing with songs and projects that and mixtapes that they're working on, and then you can make some money that way. Because I even had some internships for just silly things like organizing organizing my library. But from that, then you get my drum library. You know, I have an extensive library of sounds. So I mean, you just want to get with viable different producers. I think and other engineers and get under them that way. So use social media. I mean, that's the opportunity that I didn't have. We, I didn't even know names. Now you can Google people. We ain't had no Google name. When you, you, I, you, if I told you the nightmare stories I had meeting a and and thinking that they're a and they're not really a and Wow. Because there was no, <laughs> no way to know if it was really a and or that. So you have, a lot of, you have a lot of weapons that you can utilize these days. What would you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, had, I've been an intern and I've had interns, and I was an intern at Atlantic Records when I was in college, and now I've just recently had Atlantic rent out my studio for a while, so that was great, kind of a full circle, like, ha, oh, this is better than going to get this guy Dunkin' Donuts coffee, and like, okay, cool. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've had some interns, I've pulled most of them from my undergrad department that I went to, and, you know, this, my wife made me hire a, a woman, I had like five or six, you know, it was just like five, five young white dudes and then a girl. She was just like crumpled about the through her She's like, you have to hire her. I was like, okay, 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 okay. You're right. And she's the best thing that ever happened to like my studio and like the social world. And it was so enlightening to me, you know, because it can easily be just like a dude dominated world. And having a female around, I'm like, oh, this is great. Just like. She, she can remember everyone's name in a way that I can't. She's just like, anytime we had a female coming to the studio, they were just much more at ease, because it was just a bunch of dudes. Yep. And so like, that was just like a learning thing for me, too. And she became an employee for two years, and she ultimately just moved to LA just to get out of New York. But she's, my door is always open for her. And I've had probably three or four other interns, and it's always a great experience. Like, because I've been an intern and had bad experiences, I, I pay them. Not a lot, but it's just like, I will always, here's like, yeah. subway cards, some lunch, some money, and if they come and help me on like a job, where it's like, you know, we're going to record a concert, or film something, always throw money their way just to like, because it's your time. Like, you know, that's just my, I don't look at it, but, uh, and I have to agree with what you said about like, aligning yourself with a producer too, because studios are so much more ad hoc than they used to be, so much like, smaller things, and like, just, you know, a big producer can do something at home and then also wind up in a huge studio, like very like the same day kind of thing. So I would totally agree with that and like the way the landscape has changed with like aligning yourself with a producer and not just a, a physical brick and mortar establishment. So, because like even though I'm a studio owner, I'm still working at other studios all the time. And like I spend 25% of my time in my studio and then I'm at other locations a lot. So, you do on location and live work, right? Yeah, so I do like, I mean, I'm a a rock guitarist and drummer. If I had my way, that's what I would do, but that just isn't how, how it unfolded. So I've got a music production studio and a video production studio in the same building. And so, you know, one music is just like full of instruments and all the gear, the other one's a big white room with a bunch of lights and cameras and, you know, for different kinds of projects. And my business has really turned into doing audio and video stuff together. So we do a lot of music related videos. We film concerts, multi track record concerts. Occasional live sound. I really don't like doing live sound, but sometimes it comes our way. And uh, and so that's I, I don't like video as much as I like audio. But if I can take my skill set and bring like great audio to video, like that's a lot of fun. So I'm still kind of like trying to stay in the same world, I guess. 
that's actually an important, or leads me to an important question, definitely for you too, but also for you, um, especially in the age of YouTube, which I think is now the dominant music platform, period. What would you say about the importance of visuals in the music production world now? And uh, like, especially for you, because I think you compose almost exclusively for TV. Yeah. So, I mean, that's almost essential to your job, but how much of visuals would you have to know and understand? Is it something you need to... How much will I need to understand the medium? Yeah. That's a good question. I haven't really thought about it. Um, I feel like I've always had a sixth sense for scoring the medium, but uh, my music has always been a little bit different from like what most people want to write. I find that uh, my music is best when uh, accompanying something else, supporting as a supporting role. Uh, and it's its own challenge, but it's what I enjoy. But that's that's uh, just its own thing. And speaking to the importance of visuals, without visuals, would you have a viable career? No, I, I guess that's the thing, is that uh, I've always written in a much more simple way that if, if most of my music were just put on stage, you know, I think it would be kind of boring <laughs> for a while. Uh, slow moving. I mean, there were, one of the composers that I was always really obsessed with, I'm not sure if it's a name that anybody knows here, but Heinrich Goretzky, and his music was just, it was like a, um, I mean, in a way it involves like turning on a faucet slowly for three hours and waiting for it to like <laughs> full stream. I mean, it's just like, it, it's boring to most people, but like it's very, uh, I don't know. It does something for me, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's the, the visuals really carry everything that I do. I think that's really important. Is that like I try to take a complete backseat to it. Well, what would you say to visuals? I'm curious. What I would say about visuals now is that um, I believe that each new medium is how you need to promote yourself, and I think whoever is first on a new medium, a new platform, is going to reap the, the, the um, rewards of that. And I'll give you an example. Um, everybody, I don't know if you guys remember, you might got, you might be a little bit young, but when 50 Cent came around, there was that whole, that was the emergence of the mixtape. Yeah. And, and yeah. Um, he was the first one to really utilize that and make that look like an album, and he really performed well. And then yeah. right after that, then there was another stage of battle rappers, and the yeah. battle rap DVDs. And the people that came out on those battle rap DVDs got a deal. And then after that, then you had MySpace, and then the first people that used MySpace, they really, they got deals. So I, I think if now we have Snapchat and we have Instagram and you see people getting deals out of those situations, and then you have the YouTube situation. So I think what you need to do is you need to find and you need to always know what's going on with technology. Read the New York Times, read the science pages and see what's going on with technology and try to be ahead of the curve so you can be a part of that first new medium and be it be involved in that and then use that to market yourself and then allow yourself with a good um, uh, social media person, presence or, or PR person. And that's how you really get your name out there these days. Before, when I was growing up, it was all about get yourself a big manager. But now I really think that the most important person in the music industry is the PR people because you have social media, you have blog spots, and that's where music is really living at. Because Yes, we do look at things on YouTube, but you mostly, most of the time you see it, it's on a block. And that's how things go viral. So, that was Would you say that music needs to have a visual component to it now as part of the creative process? Or does that be made for visual to survive? Or is there a way to get it out there without the visuals? I, I, I think that the way that life is now with this new medium, I think that you have to have visuals attached to it or people won't be. Like even if because people over over time your um your patience in your your time goes down like things are 15 seconds now you get 15 seconds sound spots and sound bites and things so I think you want to utilize visuals along with that to make things go bigger for you. And for you it's it's almost a different story because it's part of it. yeah it's, I mean if if I took a step back and looked at it just from like a business standpoint uh, I do you know again I like just producing rock records that's what I love doing. But it turned into, my friend's got a production company. He goes, hey man, I got this commercial. Can you mix the audio for it? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I didn't thought I would never done it before. But I was like, yeah, sure, of course. No problem. <laughs> Figured out how to, you know, got on board with that. And now, like, you know, five years later, that's like two or three times a month, like, makes a commercial spot. And that, 
is, I mean, I'm clear, you know, I'm working with composers and stuff and doing some sound design and uh, get a big old screen in the studio because it's like, oh, I've spent a lot of time like looking at this now, like looking and listening, and that has become so much more of the workflow. And I, whenever we record a concert, you know, I mix it to picture. I always get like a rough edit or even just like the wide angle. And when I'm doing the mix, I'm mixing it to picture. And then, and to kind of shift to the music business, music is consumed in such a different way now. You want to listen to something, I'm, I'm guilty of it, like, I'll go to YouTube and just type it in. It's going to be like kind of a low quality audio stream, but like, you know, you're either looking at a blank thing or you want something, you're, you're naturally, your brain just wants something to accompany it. And kind of again, from a business standpoint, the first thing I did was open my music studio and I, I had a, four pallets shipped from Alaska. When I moved all my stuff here, I had four pallets like 10 feet high of all of my equipment, like everything I've ever owned in my life, put on a truck down to Seattle. And it was a, a ship to Seattle and a truck over here. Mm. Wow. And miraculously nothing broke. Wow. And I set it all up and I opened the studio and I was trying to make 300 bucks a day just like recording bands. And in three months I was kind of like, this is terrible, <laughs> this, is, this is very slow, this is not working. This, all right, let's regroup here. And my wife went to film school, and so we kind of like banged our heads together, like, all right. And so we bought some cameras and started like doing these live sessions. So we'd have bands come through my studio that were on tour. And then it kind of snowballed, and we did like 60 of these in a summer for free. Because we had, I had no work. I didn't have a client paying me for a damn thing for like three months. Because I had just opened my doors, and I was like, I was starting, I was networking. And instead of like doing it for someone else, I was doing it for myself. <clears throat> and so we did all these things for free. And I got my name attached to a whole bunch of artists that I would have loved to work with in a traditional, you know, record producing way. But that wasn't the way, they were all like one or two levels above me. But I got to meet them, I got to record them, I got to mix them, and I got to like put it out there on social media. It's like, this band was in my studio, here they are holding my cute little dog, here's a photo of us all together. And that just kind of like became a thing where now, we do these and PR companies come to us, like you said, the PR people are like kind of the tastemakers now. They're the ones that come to us and like, hey, this band's in town. And it's like, yeah, instead of free, now there's thousands of dollars and I get to, you know, employ my crew. And now there's five of us or six of us and it's like a production. So a production company was kind of born out of desperation of like, well, this traditional music studio model is not working. Let's add this visual component to it. And then, so five years later, like business is super good. I'm doing this, the, the music studio now is doing well just as a music studio because the network grew so much by doing all the visual stuff. So to answer your question, like visual is 110 percent of it, <laughs> like wow. super important. So for for me, it has been. And your your thing actually, I had to jot it down so I don't forget because my mind's mushy right now, but. Collaboration, the importance of finding collaborative partners. Because once upon a time, at least in bad old days, you would go into a studio, everybody pretty much had a clearly defined role. There was going to be an engineer, there was going to be an assistant, there was going to be a producer, there was going to be an artist. But now it, it's almost like the three of you are almost doing a lot of creative content on your own in a way, and production content on your own. So I guess two part question, what's the importance of finding people to collaborate with? And what would you look for in a collaborator if you had to find one? Is that a, is that a clear it's question? That's a, a pro and con question. Yeah. It's a, it's a, Cause there's pros to finding collaborators, but then the, the con would be, you're gonna get less money. Well, do you need a collaborator, number one? Do you feel like, to cover? I don't feel like I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, no, I think that it depends on, it depends on what you want to do because even though I feel like I'm, I'm a pretty good piano player, there's other piano players that are better than me, and there's some piano players that aren't better than me, but I like their feel. And I want their feel on this record, or I want this person, I'm not getting the drum feel that I want, and I feel like I'm a good drum programmer, but I want to use this other person's drum feel because he's actually good at that. So I think you have, I, I believe that the, the, we've lost a lot of magic in music because some of the things were collaborative. We collaborated. We had a whole orchestra. You know, we had Gamble and Huff. They had a whole orchestra coming, and that has a certain energy. And um, Stevie Wonder, you know, Stevie Wonder did "Can't Help It" for um, 
for uh, Michael Jackson, but Quincy Jones produced it, so it wasn't just Stevie Wonder by itself. And I think that even was more alive for most of Stevie Wonder's songs because of the whole overall production of it, because now you have another mind that can see, oh, I see this composition you have, let's sh reshape it and let's retool it and let's get this person to play on it. And I think there are pros to it, but now budgets are so small, they, they expect you to do everything by yourself. So, like I spoke to an a um, couple of months ago, and I had a whole sit down with her, like, yeah, I want to go back and start doing stuff. And she was like, yeah, but everybody engineers now, so and everybody plays every instrument now. And everybody does all this stuff now. So what's so special about you now? You know what I'm saying? So that so everybody is expected to do everything. You're expected to do the vocal arrangements, you spoke to, you're they're expected to sing. And I've I've worked with Teddy Riley and I've watched him do this. I've seen seen and seen Teddy Riley sing, write the whole song, sing all the lyrics, mix it himself, and that's what they expect you to do now. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. shocked sometimes at what people ask me to, to yeah. do. That's just way outside. I, I got asked by a guy to write a, a gospel piece. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I, I, I've never even listened to it. I can't write. I can't write lyrics. Yeah. Like I write music. I mean, mm -hmm. but uh, that's what they expect. But it is true. I mean, I'm totally independent. Like for me, when the word collaboration is is thrown at me, I think of like the the directors I work with, producers. Mm -hmm. Like that's collaborative. Mm -hmm. Because I am working hand in hand with them to meet their vision, and that that fuels me. Mm -hmm. Like I want to do what they want to do, and the producers I work with, like I couldn't do it without them because I, they're my sounding board. I send music to them, and they're going to come back and be like, "All right, Aaron, here's what you got to fix." And uh, without that, like you know, it's it's like working with an editor. So that is your. For me, my collaboration, but everything else, you know, I think it is kind of expected to be. You could be too many yeah. chefs in the kitchen at some times, yeah. too. And it's just, you have to deal with a lot of egos. So, like, if I already have an ego about how I view music and I want to be chef, I could just totally change the energy. So, you have to also collaborate with people that you guys work together and you're not fighting each other in button heads. And that, it, it, too many chefs in the kitchen sometimes is not good. So, it depends. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's the sounding board. It's really good to have a sounding board. As a composer that works in my studio, maybe like three days a week, and if he's in there for eight hours, I go. He texts me, and I come up to my office every three hours, and he's just like, "What do you think of this? I think it's terrible." And I'm like, "Dude, it's great," <laughs> like you know, because he's like psyching himself out because he is. It's all him, and he, you know, before he even sends it to his producers or the director or whatever, he like you know wants a second set of ears, and then he you know close the door, get the hell out of here, and we get back to work. <laughs> but like, and we have a great thing going that way, and I have. I found a couple people that I like to work with and I like to be around, and we work together all the time. You know, like my old college roommate, we just like happened to like this same horrible band, and like <laughs> uh, we just became close friends. And then he and I have literally been around the world now doing video projects. Like we've been to probably four different continents together. Like, and you know, we're you just found him and we like stuck together as a both group. And we met at a time where neither of us. Had, you know, had any credit, really. Like, we're both kind of getting our start. And I'm, I'm very, very, very much the kind of guy that's like, you meet someone, you stick with them, and you grow together. Like, I had one experience where I, I was working with a band, very, very, very invested with these guys, and we were coming up, and they got signed, and they blew up, and basically gave me the middle finger, and it was like, the ties are over. And that just, like, broke my heart. It totally broke my heart, because we are friends, super invested so if anything I've dug in more now it's like find people you like stick with them don't screw them over and you guys come up together if I succeed they succeed and they succeed I succeed and we all win like so in that sense like yeah I'm a firm believer in collaborators but on the other on the other side of it uh, my business name is Braun Studios my last name is Braun I put my name on everything like if you want to like what is Eric's brand it's Braun it's like, my friends make fun of me all the time, like I'm an idiot, but, my, but it's, my grandpa did it, my dad did it, like, it runs deep in my family. Everything is brawn. And that makes it actually super hard to like hire people and send them to do a job, because now it's like four other people are going to represent your name and your business. And as my business has grown, it's like terrifying, because if I'm there, I can kind of be a control freak to a certain extent and make sure it's done the way I want it because that's what I'm selling. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not there, it's not always that simple. So these are like growing pains that I'm currently going through. 
And it's great because business is doing better and there are times where I can't be in two places at once anymore. I can't be in the music studio and I can't be in the video studio and I can't be on location. Like I've got to, there's three jobs going on the same day. Like, got to figure out who's going to go do what. And it's like, ugh. <laughs> so again, find people you like and you trust and stick with them. And like, got to make sure I pay them better and like, whatever, just to like, keep it tight knit. So, yeah, collaborators totally. So collaborators are important, but the yeah. right collaborators. The right collaborators. And when you find the right one, duck in and you'll fight about a little bit of money. I don't know. Because <laughs> like, the wrong collaborators can kill the pot. Yeah. 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 Um, the other thing I want to, and then I'll have to steer back again, is the importance of networking. Um, number one, is it important? <laughs> <laughs> and number two, how, how would you how would you go about building a network nowadays? I imagine most of you guys are just basically starting off. You don't have extensive networks yet. Um, I can speak from my own experience that once the phone starts ringing and you have a network, you, even though freelance is kind of a scary thing, it's not so scary anymore once the phone just keeps on ringing. But the question is, how do you get the phone to start ringing in the first place? How do you, where do you begin? I mean, I can only really answer the first part of the question, but I mean, I think it's, we're laughing because networking is everything. Yes. But, you know, I think, I think the thing that you got to get into your heads, if I could get out a soapbox about this, is that talent is so common. Like, especially here in New York. Like, it's just, we grow up, maybe not in New York, but you know, I was from Arizona, and you, there's that one kid at the high school who's an amazing trumpet player, and you know, everyone's like, oh yeah, he's going to all the he's doing all this stuff. But there's one of those in every school, and there's a lot of high schools. Talent is so common, and that's not what's gonna get you a job. So, the difference between the best violinist at Juilliard and the worst violinist at Ohio State is just not that big of a deal. Mm. Mm. You, need, you need to know people, you need to be friendly. Like, I would hire, I mean, if like the greatest violinist in the world came to me, and he was a diva, and he was a pain in the ass to work with, I would throw him out the door and use someone else. Like, I don't care how good you are, you're just playing whole notes anyhow. <laughs> 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 it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I want people to be friendly, I want to have a good vibe, I want, I mean, you know, and I, I hire my friends. And like, what, what you guys were saying, I pay it forward. Like, people from my, from, from grad school, people went out of their way to play my music for free, and they didn't have to do that on a concert. So mm -hmm. now, I can hire them. I can be like, you know what, I really appreciate what you did for me back then, I'm going to hire you now. I mean, they networked. Yep. They, did, they did their job in school. Well, I was going to say, he, uh, Robert said, you know, I don't know if any of you guys have a network. This will sound cheesy, but here is your first network. Mm -hmm. Like, in this class, if you guys don't know each other, you're doing yourself a disservice by not knowing each other. Because exactly. everyone, 90% <laughs> of the people I work with, I went to college with. And like, there was only 28 of us per grade. So it was like a hundred, just a hundred, a hundred and change in the four years. And like half of them are doing something else and they had the half that stuck in it. Well, we all just like had this same experience in common. And the, the first thing I like, hey, do I know someone that plays this? Oh yeah, this guy, or, you know, she did this. And that's my first like mental Rolodex is the people I went to college with and shared, shared that time with. And then from there, usually if I can't find it, it comes from like one more level outside of those people. So like, don't like undervalue what is just in this room or like in this time of your life because like, you know, there's a lot of talent and there's probably a lot of talented people in here. Yeah. And like, just make friends with each other. <laughs> and don't piss each other off too. That was like the other one is like in that small amount of people, now like this one girl I went to school with, is Dr. Luke's right-hand woman. Mm. She runs his publishing company, wow. essentially. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, huh, thank God I never pissed her off. Because <laughs> I like introduced a very close friend to them, and now they're, you know, they're working together. Like, you kind of just a ch -ch -ch easy. Mm -hmm. And you can like triangulate, and it's fun to watch. Like, where have people gone? And what are like, oh, she's a music lawyer now? Like, I thought she was going to quit all this. Like, so. Absolutely. I mean, it started here for me, like I said. And I mean, you know, it's funny because Salt and Pepper met each other here in Queensboro. You know, that's crazy. So, like, yeah, yeah. How they met in Queensboro? Yeah. They met in Queensboro. Yeah, you never told us that. I've been here long enough to know that. I've seen you every day. 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 I
That's crazy. I know I saw that episode. Well, I was coming back to that open, bro. <laughs> so, so yes, I mean, networking is like, like I said, it wouldn't, like, networking is so important that, like I said, when I first told you my story about how I met Irv, it's like I met Irv and he didn't like any of my stuff, and they just have this industry face. You go every a and they just, they just have this face like they all break the 48 laws of power, like don't give anything away. Yeah. And it's just this whole vibe. And then when they get to know you, when you find when you find people with vices, I'm gonna give you a little secret. You have to find people's vices, what do people like. Once you find out, what, I mean, this is real talk. If you find out what people like, you can get a DJ to play your record. I mean, mostly when I first started, DJs didn't understand how much power they really had, mostly in smaller markets. Like the smaller market DJs might be sweeping the floor, and he's the program director, and he's working at a car lot somewhere, you know, like, so, but, so you can like, he, a, a DJ in St. Louis is like, if you give me these headphones, I'll play your record all day long. So it's just like, you know what people want and what they what they desire, find those things, get that to them, and you'll get things done. So that's number one. Number two is just be on top. I don't like to be late. You know, I you don't understand how, like people just, I'm not the best organist, but now I'm working at a church. I didn't, like, I didn't know nothing about gospel music either. And they're like, well, we want you to play at the church. And because I play piano with me, I know anything about church music, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so now I play at the church and I'm playing organ. I'm, and I had to learn how to play organ over the year. And it's just like, they hired me because of my personality. They hired me because I'm professional. They hired me before because I'm I never missed a day. And they had and they had a guy that was working there before me. And he could sing and he could play and everything. I'm like, why didn't they hire this guy? Because he had a drug problem. Hmm. He was he was he was he was always late. He would miss sometimes. He didn't call. He would miss rehearsal. He was a, he was a professional. So be professional. Be on time. Be on time. People were never on time, and that's the reason why they keep hiring me. And, and it, even if they wanted to fire you, they're like, "Well, I just like he's such a good guy. Like, like <laughs> let that be the reason why you keep. It doesn't matter. Just keep getting the check. You know. So like networking, make friends. Yeah. yeah, you said it. You were like, you know, not gonna hire if the best violinist is a diva. And I'll hire the third best or the fourth best or the fifth best if I like being in a room with them more. Exactly. And like I don't, I'm on set a lot now and it's like eight, ten, twelve hour days. There's a lot of downtime and if someone's a pain in the ass, it's like you don't want to. <laughs> if you got any control over the situation, then, then you're not going to hire them again. And that so I to go back to that uh, doing all this is a networking thing. All those free music live music videos we did. Three years later, that manifested into I got a gig at the New York Times doing like video production for them, and then three months into that, I was working with like a cooking show, second camera or something like that, and then they ultimately hired me to produce a series for them called In Performance, and so I made like a hundred videos of In Performance over about a year and a half, and what those are are intimate live performances with actors that are on Broadway. So it's like either a play or a musical from Broadway, and the star of the play would come in and do a scene, and it was with no makeup, no costumes, just like the whole point was to remove all of that and just have it be about the performance. So as a result of doing all these free things, a couple years later, here I am like directing James Earl Jones, directing Courtney Love, like directing, it was just like this bucket list of like, oh my God, this is like everyone that walked in the door was super famous. And here I am, just like this, to tell them what to do. <laughs> because like the way that they look on screen is all in my hands, you know. Because I'm shooting it, like running the whole show. I'm doing doing the light design, like all of it. And so that was like a big like aha moment of like, oh, I networked. I put in a lot of sweat equity of not getting paid. I was always on time, and I was pleasant to be around. And I was always on time. <laughs> For the New York Times, man, like they called me back all the time because I was early and I always delivered it early. Always deliver always, early. Always, yeah. like, don't ever say something and not follow through with it. Like, if you give yourself a deadline that's unrealistic, you better get it done. Because yeah. <laughs> as a result of that New York Times thing, then I started doing travel shows for them. And then now I've done over 100 videos for that company that's one of the largest publications in the world. They have since folded pretty much all of their video production. So I lost them as a client, which was a huge like, hit to my business. But it didn't matter because any other company that like hears my name, like, oh, you did all those videos for them? Like, I don't even have to interview you. You're hired. You know, that's a, that became a calling card. 
And that was all just through networking and being on time. So. You guys are also speaking about something else, uh, which I would call work ethic. <laughs> it's not just knowing people, it's what you're known for. Yeah. Um, so having that good work ethic and having that reliability is, is kind of paramount. I, there's one thing I'm not sure which direction to go with it, but I'll try and formulate the question anyway. Do you work for an employer or do you work for yourself? No, I'm. A, it's a mixture of freelance and my own business. Freelance and your own business. You work for an employer. Freelance in the business. Same thing. Like 600 employers. Yeah, yeah. But you, you work for. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to answer that in the sense that I would ask you guys what's the difference at a certain point. Like, I've got a business, I've got a brick and mortar location, and I have clients. So in a way, that could be freelance. But I'm not. I guess at this point, I'm not just a guy doing a thing. Like. I try and have, I've tried to not call myself a freelancer. I don't know what the difference is actually. But you're working for yourself. But I, I own my own, yeah, like I have my own, I don't have an employer, so I guess it's freelance. The answer is we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying, but like, you know, my wife called me a freelancer and I get mad. I'm like, I'm not, I have a brick and mortar location, I've got a studio, I've got insurance, I've got like this much overhead every month to get to the next month. Like at what point, do you just kind of like become a business? I know what it is. The W-2 versus W-9. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You guys aren't collecting W-2s for the most part. You're probably collecting, well, you might be collecting something else, but a stack of 10 at the end of the year. That's the end of the year. So you don't have a real employer is what I'm saying. No, but it's, it all falls on all three of our shoulders yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to generate it, yeah. Maybe 20 or 30 years ago, it might have been a real, like, realistic expectation in the industry to work for someone. I don't know. If you any of you would say that that's a real, realistic expectation anymore, I have friends that still do it. It's just it's similar to a lot of jobs like uh, like being a professor, where you've got to wait for people to retire for yeah. you to, to fill. I mean, it's not something you can really count. Especially on. in this field of audio and video and media production, it's like there's not just like thousands of jobs open at any given time. Yeah, yeah you got to wait. For a friend of mine with what I would consider a pretty, you know. Not that way, you know, just a, a regular working composer job where he's expected to be like the, the Swiss Army knife of composers and tackle everything from metal to mm -hmm. to string quartets. Uh, but he's like, if you looked at his resume, it would be just I, he played with Ray Charles and Barry Manilow, and he's <laughs> won a, a dozen Grammys and 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 you know. And like, uh, you know, how are you going to replace that guy? <laughs> I, that's what I ask. It's like you can't walk in that door and hand your resume and say, like, I'd like to be hired. What I would say about um, those jobs, uh, when I first started working in the industry and I would go to the labels, you might have three floors. Like, let's say Def Jam. I did a lot of business at Def Jam because we're really making things like the rock and things of like that nature. So it was three floors of Def Jam. And Every floor had cubicles filled with people. Energy in the building was busting. Years go by, less cubicles, to the point where Def Jam is like half of a floor, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and you had 10 a &Rs in just the rap department, and you had 10 a &Rs in the rock department, now you have one a &R that's overseeing all these different um, things. So it's, it's, it's hard to find a job at a label if you're looking for an internship or a job at a label, it's very hard to find that now because They've, con they, they've consolidated down to, I mean, we had eight, seven distribution companies when I first started, now it's three, you know, so they've made the industry small. To be fair, uh, there it is worth pointing out that there are some industries that are expanding, like music licensing is just like, it is enormous, and like, it used to be, I feel like all these companies, they wanted exclusive rights to music, yeah, but now cool. they don't really care it. They made it cheap actually to license. Um, you can actually, like, before, if you wanted to license a song, you wanted to cover, you wanted to make a cover album. It was almost impossible. It would take you months and months to get all those licenses, to track down those licenses. Now they have a website that you can pay for how many licenses you want, depending upon how many sales you have $29, $59, $100 for how many licenses you want. And they get it done in two days. 
that's amazing. <laughs> like that's crazy. You know what I mean? They like it's it's, it's all right. It's a whole other business, but they need a whole lot of people to do a lot of research. So they have to hire people to do that. There are jobs there. There are plenty of people who've gone into music supervising, you know. I mean, some of that's like phone call, but it's knowing lots of people, knowing lots of indie bands, being, you know, because you're the kind of person that, that can get someone to license their music to someone that they don't want to license it to, which is usually <laughs> a product or brand yeah. or something. Yeah. It's like. If I would attribute the rise of that uh, music licensing business to the proliferation of how much video content there is now. I mean, there's more video content than there's ever been. We can all make it, which is insane. Like 10 years ago, we couldn't make it. There's a huge entry point to like create video content. Now we've all, except for you, we've all got smartphones. So, so. <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> The thing I'm, I'm hoping to formulate is, in other words, unless you're going to go into something like music licensing or something like that, you're probably going to end up self-employed. Is that a fair thing to say? Even as a business owner, you're self-employed. You're paying your own. Yeah, I, yeah. Like I'm actually getting ready to hire my first employee on salary. Which is totally terrifying, <laughs> like just absolutely terrifying. But I, it's like time to do that, you know. Like I told you, like I'm having a kid, so my wife's having a kid in a couple of weeks. So like I can't exactly now go work six. I, I'm generally six days a week. I get up and go to my studio. I'm there by nine in the morning. I'm usually there until eight or nine at night, and I'm usually there on Saturdays. Like Sunday is the one day I try and take off. So and that's how I've grown is because I just I just work six seven days a week. Do it, and I take a lot of the tasks on myself to pay less people to like build up the money. But now it's like, okay, well, I can't really run my business and have a family the same way I was. Reality check. So how do I change that? <laughs> so that's terrifying. But you know, I've been in the same way. I'm like, well, I guess I'm creating a job. Like, that's that's cool. But I hope to create two or three more in the next couple of years. Hope to. But there are, you know, I have friends that have jobs. To like have nine to five jobs in the music industry, like you know, like they exist. They still ex <laughs> they do exist, but the landscape now is you know we were discussing like you're expected to be able to do like five different things, so, and that you kind of turn into a jack of all trades. And when I was getting my start, someone would call me like, hey man, can you do this? I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, we can do that. And I'm like, well, gotta figure out how to do that now. <laughs> like, no time to become an expert at that. <laughs> I have found myself like installing sound systems in bars. You know, like I've been, I've been like on the edges of what I would say I'm really good at. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but and now I'm kind of trying to reel it back into like, all right, let's focus on two or three things that I'm good at and cut out that other stuff. Somebody asked me to fix their computer though. <laughs> Big round thing keeps rolling around. Like, you come back. <laughs> All right, let me come check it out. <laughs> Always get the money. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's there's two things I think that would come out of that. Number one, how do you, if you are someone, how would you go about creating opportunity for yourself? Um, the other part of this question, which is a completely different direction, is, or maybe it's not, is branding yourself. Because, well, I guess, could you speak to that? To yeah. that, like, I um, I was just going to mention, they, they do expect people to do a lot more, but you still got to have that one thing that yeah. you are like, Absolutely. that thing that you're a pro at. Because if you're just a jack of all trades, no one needs you. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, I brand myself as orchestral music. Because, like, I knew not very many people can do that, and, you know, I could, I, when I was working at a company, I mean, they had me write metal and, and all kinds of things that I had no business doing. But, like, at a certain point, when you're getting out there and you're a freelancer or you're self-employed, there's got to be a reason right, where people say to themselves, I need a fill-in-the-blank, Aaron can do that. Because otherwise, no one's going to really think of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you say? <laughs> oh, branding. Yeah, I absolutely believe that. Like for me, I just like 
Well, the thing that I'm the best at is playing piano. So there wasn't a lot of, um, in the world of hip hop, there wasn't a lot of producers that were actually classical pianists. You know, mm -hmm. like they don't even know, they couldn't tell you the difference between Mozart and Beethoven, most people, <laughs> and from what we do, you know. Like, so I think that's what made me unique, and I think that's what made things easier for me. They just seen a dude from the hood, a black dude from the hood, that could play Chopin. And they're like, oh, you know, get him. <laughs> He's got it. I mean, like, Herb used to tell Ashanti, like, oh, go talk to Fingers. He knows that music stuff. That's, that, that's literally what he said, like, <laughs> like music stuff. <laughs> I didn't say that. That's, that's literally what he said. So, I mean, it, it's, good to, it's good to brand yourself in what your, the, what your greatest strength is, but you have to, because when I, first start, when I first started, all I knew was piano, classical. I didn't know how to play jazz. I didn't know how to play R&B. I didn't know how to play anything. So I had to train my ear. I didn't have an ear. I had to train my ear. I had to learn how to play by ear. Now I play by ear more than I read music. And now I suck at reading music now, honestly. Wow. And, and um, I did that. Then I had to learn how to play guitar. So I had to learn how to play guitar, saxophone, drums, <laughs> bass. I had to learn how to play all these instruments. Then I had no idea how to use anything on the computer. I was not tech savvy at all. Now it's to the point where I'm like almost IT on computers sometimes. You know what I'm saying? And um, it's, it's crazy. You have to keep evolving for the times. And I think that all the other producers that I know, I know producers that still use the MPC 60, and they don't, they haven't learned a chord, a scale, or anything. And I think that my my advantage over a lot of my competitors is that I, I always want to evolve and know what's going on. I'm always looking at what's going on in technology, what's going on with with everything, and how the whole world relates in somehow. Like politics relates to your music. Being being inspired by everything to grow because. Listen to that sound bite from this person might inspire your music this way. Um, hey, maybe I need to think about marketing myself this way. You can learn something from every aspect of life. So open your, yourself up to all the possibilities that life has to offer. You have your brand, so. Well, I've got the bronze brand. Yeah, right. but, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's tough because I'm, um, you know, i got my start playing guitar. I'm a good drummer. Like, I'm good at engineering. I love producing music. Uh, I love creating projects and seeing them to through to fruition. You know, like I love starting and finishing something. I love just like being part of projects. And so I used to call myself a music producer. That was like if you met me, I'd be like, "Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a music producer." And then that has turned into I'm a music and video producer. And that's about as succinctly as I can define like what I am. And that will change to just I'm a producer. And it's funny because the term producer today has a lot of different meanings. Mm -hmm. Like, you're a producer and I'm a producer, but <laughs> I might be working on a toothpaste commercial <laughs> and you might be trying you know, writing some gospel music. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, so it, it's funny that way. And so, you know, I'd come to you for an orchestral score. You'd come to me and be like, I've got a project that's got a bunch of moving parts. Who's going to make it happen? And that's become what like I sell essentially is like and I try to not do it all myself anymore because I've got a music studio, a video studio, I've got an equipment rental business for all that stuff. And that's like, you know, twenty percent of my income is like, oh you need some lights, you need some cameras, like come to me, I'll read that stuff. Uh, and when it all is a home run for me is when I get the whole project, I can staff it, I can have it done in my studios with all of my equipment. And that's like start to finish of providing the space, the people, the equipment, the know-how, and the post-production. Like, so I'm kind of like a production house, and I'm the guy at the top of it with my own little, my own tiny little empire that's like a couple thousand square feet, you know? Like, but I drive by Silver Cup Studios every day. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Silver yeah. Cup. Here, I mean, just the biggest square footage, it's enormous, and they just opened another, there's like three of them. But like I drive over the 59th Street Bridge every morning, and it's just like this huge sign that says Silver Cup. And like in my delusional brain, like that's what I want to do, and that's like where I think I'm gonna go in 20 more years. Could very well not happen, but I'm like kind of insane enough to be like, yeah, I think I can do that. <laughs> and it takes like a little extra self confidence <laughs> to be the guy that's gonna be self employed and like sell yourself as a one man business, and that can turn into like hubris and like being a little too confident and a little too egomaniacal at times and I have been through that in my younger ages and like trying to not be that way but just balance like I dream big like you know I'm just a kid from Anchorage Alaska that grew up like commercial fishing and like now I own some property in New York and I've got some stuff and now I'm trying in 10 years to go to the next spot so you gotta like 
believe in, I mean, it's totally point, but like believe in yourself and like have confidence in that you're good at whatever you're doing. Because if whoever you're trying to get the job from senses that you might not think you're the best at it, they're not gonna hire you. Like, I think that you're probably a damn good composer. And I think you're probably a great musician because you guys both sold yourself to me. Mm. Like, you know, I, I got some piano I need done. Like now we have networked successfully now these two guys have networked with me and I hope that I've networked with them and I hope that we've networked with you too like in that same yeah. sense like I don't know you need a project you want to get it done like call me <laughs> you want to do some shit I'm great at it let's do it <laughs> but see, I, I love what he just said because the, for me I, I remember when I first started I was 19 years old and I used to have I'm kidding for it, I used to have panic attacks why am I not on right now like, I, I felt that confident in my ability. Like, I'm supposed to be famous right now. Why is this not happening, you know? And, and it's just like, to be spiritual, I know people might not know about the law of attraction or believe in that, but I believe you attract that type of energy to it. And I kind of dreamed it and visualized it without even knowing that I was doing that. I kind of, I, I would go to night, I would go to sleep at night and I'd just see myself on stage and I'd see myself mm -hmm. getting awards. And, and I have to say, when I look at my vision board, most things that I vision happen for. You know, right. most of them I focus on it and I believe in myself. And everybody that I gave advice to, the people that listen to me and listen to themselves and follow through are all the people that got checks. I got a lot of people checks by just just like if you do this, this is how the industry works. <laughs> if you do this, you'll get a check. Just follow through, stay with it. It's it's not gonna be overnight sensation. It might take six months because um I, real quick. It was some people that, um, a real quick story about my friend. He was a producer also. He made put it on me for top. And um, he was down in Atlanta. He saw that I made Holla Holla is on the radio. I was going to move with him down to Atlanta, too. That's a long story. But, but um, <laughs> he saw that my son was playing on the radio all the time, so he wanted to come back up and he wanted to start making beats. I like, but he wasn't really that great of a producer. He's my friend, but he wasn't really that good. But I'm like, I'm going to show you how to do this. You're just going to come hang out with us every day in the studio. And I just know how these guys are. They're gonna, who is this guy? Who are you? Don't say anything. Don't say you make any beats. Don't do anything. They just like that. They just want to know. So every day he would come and he would just hang out and they're like, so who's this guy? Like, That's my man. Don't worry about it. So six months later, I was like, you can say you make beats now. And he's like, all right. So now they, now they want to hear. Instead of you bringing your stuff to them, it's kind of like, don't call us, we'll call you. So if you make them want to hear what you call, oh, you break it, you bite. That's why I can't have a smartphone. <laughs> yeah. So um, you got to make these people want you. So then after after a couple of months, then he found, they asked him to hear the beats. And so he played the beats. And the first beat they played, they told him was pretty long. So, so I think that you have to entice people. And you have to, you have to like be strategic about how you attack your business. No, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but the, there was one, and I want to start throwing out the questions to you because I don't want to run out of time. I want to make sure everybody gets to ask as many questions as they want. There's one last point that I feel is really important. I'm hearing it in what some of you guys are saying. What's the importance of perseverance? Like, did you have a gut check moment where it was like, oh my gosh. It's either sink or swim now, and either I have to go retire and flip burgers, or I'm gonna <clears> stick with this, and I'm gonna stick this out no matter what, even if I go down. I still have. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, what do you call that? Right now, right now. Right. Yeah. You got imposter syndrome. Yep. You guys heard of that? Like, where I mean, I don't care how. Like, you could be the president of the United States, and like, you wake up and just for a moment there, you're like, they're gonna figure out that I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Totally. Absolutely. Totally. And like it happens to everyone. I don't care how good you get at it. You have yeah. to fight through those moments yeah. because you're going to do stuff that you don't know or under, or you have no business doing, but you're going to learn on the job. <laughs> Just like basic with finances, like, you know, it's kind of like this, and thankfully it's got like bigger peaks and valleys, but they're still there. Like, I'm not like flush all the time, like, ah, oh, that's cool, whatever. Because you gotta like, especially in the studio business, you kind of gotta stay up to date with some stuff. You know, a five thousand dollar camera is just like out of date. Now you gotta buy the ten thousand dollar version. And then the five thousand dollar one you can't even sell for a thousand bucks anymore. If that stuff happens with equipment all the time, and yeah, go ahead. oh, for me, I just feel like it. I got spoiled. I'll be honest. You know, I got spoiled. I was in the industry, and uh, the, the least 
the least it got to a point the least I would get paid for a track would be twenty five thousand. That was the least I was getting. And then um, the, the publishing and your licensing mm -hmm. for them to put it in movies and TV and stuff like that. So for it to be now where you're lucky to get twenty five hundred dollars for a track that you work for hours, like people are like, why don't you do dubstep? Because it's gonna take me twenty four hours to make. I can make five beats. <laughs> in the time that's gonna take me to make a dubstep beat. And I'm gonna get paid the same amount of money for it. So let me go ahead and do that. So now, I mean, there's so many people that don't wanna pay. So I have, to, I have to put all these different revenue streams together to make a living now. So where I just wouldn't work at all at doing anything else, like I would just make beats all day long and playing for people and chill and go to the restaurants, go to Mr. Chow's and spend money. And, and now I'm not making nowhere near that amount of money because you got to understand when I first got in the industry, you had BT playing videos all day long. That was $4.25 every spin. Every, and that's BT and MTV. Because I'm like, the records on the radio is like seven, eight, eight cents of a spin. Mm -hmm. And you're getting played nationwide and across the country. I mean, country world, internationally. So you would make nice, um, nice checks as far as your royalties and stuff like that. But now, man, you ain't getting that money no more. So I play at church on Sunday. <laughs> I, I work here in the dance department, <laughs> play piano in the dance department. I play gigs all night long. I engineer, I mix people's songs. I produce the people. I got a new single coming out now. I just did a song for Joe Buttons and Jada Kiss and Marsha Brochus on their album a couple of months ago. Got this new kid that got a deal on um, Universal. He got a single coming out that I produced. I, listen, you might see me playing in a um, bakery. Because I just did, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> did a gig playing in a bakery. Get all of the money because I, I can't be in a point where I just put my nose up and like, oh, I'm too good to do that now. You know, like, mostly now, I have kids. Then. I got two kids. So. Man, you want, me to, you, want me to sweep, you want me to sweep the floor somewhere? I might sweep the floor somewhere and do it at home. <laughs> because I got two kids now, so you know you gotta do what you gotta do. So you just can't get boxed into like, why well, do this? And you have to span your your horizons. Do it all. Should I throw it out for questions? Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Um, but all you guys being freelance slash business owners and kind of not knowing. When, but, but not knowing, but not having the exact number of your annual income, how do you guys manage the budget? Your I mean, I don't even try. No, I'm <laughs> 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 He's uh, a face no, he looks it, bro. Right. But you, I, you know, see, if I if I could say it, like for me, I, I don't know about you, but like since. Most musicians, like, you, you rise from the bottom. Mm. So, like, by the time you're actually making money, feel good. you feel good. You've got habits yeah. where you're, like, ramen ain't so bad. So, like, you're, you're still, you know, you, you still got the cheap habits, I think. I don't know. Different people have got different I bowled out for a minute. I did. I did. I bought some fur coats. <laughs> took, some, took some trips to, like, Olivia. <laughs> no, but, I, I mean, I, for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. Like for me, now that I have, I work at schools now. You know, I teach in the Bronx. Um, I actually teach production in the Bronx, and I teach piano lessons in the Bronx. Just kids. And it's just for me. I think to be honest, in this day and age, it's good to find some type of steady job. That's why I think getting a degree is. And I know it, this guy over here, he's going. Both, both of them, both of them are good on me. Like you have to, you have to finish. Finish here, finish here, go to, go on to the next level because at least you can teach someone. You know, you, you can, while you're doing your doing your thing, mm -hmm. you get a check every week. I got two kids. You, you want to get? I got two kids. Yeah. 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 But you got a business too. I got business. Yeah. So I mean, that's. But he shows up on time. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, thing. both know how I am. <laughs> All right. I'm so for me now, when I when I do sell a track. And I do make make five thousand dollars on the side that month. Wow, that was a great month for me because yo, I just sold. I mean, like, I, it took me twenty minutes to make that beat, and I got five grand for it. So like, mm -hmm. that's a good day, you know. And then so you, but you know what you're gonna. You want to know what you're gonna make every week. You have to have set some type of goals. Yeah. So then you can set your budget. If you don't have, if you're not making your goals, then you have to make adjustments so you can make that goal. So if your goal is I need to make seven hundred fifty a week. So I can pay all my bills and do my doing my things, do that, and then your extra your extra money you save that. Mm -hmm. 
from your different gigs. Well, you got to keep in mind too, if you get a check for a thousand bucks, only 700 of that is your money. Oh, yeah. And you got to set that money aside because you owe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no boss setting aside your money and writing a check to the government for you. And if you don't do it, you're going to be in for a world of hurt at okay. the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Pay your taxes, self-employed shit, and it's like, keep all your receipts. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm uh, pretty ridiculous about like finances and stuff. You know, I'm, I have a master spreadsheet that's got a lot of tabs on it of like, who owes me money, what job did this, when was this invoice, when was this not invoice, what were my expenses. Because, you know, my taxes are done, like, January 1st, my taxes are done. Because I keep track of it twice a day. I'm like, I mean, my, my financial spreadsheet is up on one screen all day long every day. Because now I'm juggling a lot of jobs. And, you know, I would say right now, there are, like, 25 outstanding invoices, probably. Anywhere from 250 bucks to 5,000 bucks. Like, they're just, and that's the problem, is, like, I got shit I haven't paid for since October. And the bigger the company, the more impossible it is to actually get the money from them. You, mm -hmm. gotta, you, you get wow. sent to like Jan in accounting, and you get some weird email, and you got you submit like all of these things, which I've gotten very good at now. Mm -hmm. And then three months later, they're like, "Oh, we can't find your your invoice. Can you send it again?" And I'm just like, "Are you kidding me? Yep. Wow. Are you kidding?" <laughs> they always, but here's the first one. They always go on vacation the yep. day after oh. you're done. Oh my <laughs> god. Yes. Oh, yes. oh yes. the yes. person yes. in accounting just happened to be on vacation. Oh yeah, all right. They take more vacations. Oh, than Wednesday. You know. They left on Wednesday, right? <laughs> It's a guessing game to but, see when the check's gonna actually come in. Because now, I'd like to be totally candid, it's ten thousand bucks a month for me is what my overhead is. Mm -hmm. It's that's what I like. At the beginning of every month, that's what it costs me to run my business, like at a minimum. And like that's a that's a nut, and that's a real thing. That's like more than insurance. It's just like equipment, and just like a lot of shit. And that's not the elective like. All right, we're gonna buy another another microphone, or like, okay, we're gonna buy a new screen, or like, oh, this broke, we gotta get it fixed. That's just like I got a budget, to like, make sure that's in the bank, because if it's not, it's gonna be the end of the business. Mm -hmm. But you know, that being said, that means now my business has grown to a point where that's that's real, and I could do it. That does <laughs> it's like lean a lot of times. And then sometimes it's great, and you're gonna go to a baller dinner. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, but, so how do you budget? I don't know, you, you, you have to though. Like, find a system and do it. Like, understand Microsoft Excel, and like, plan. And if you get a check, don't think that all that money is yours. It's not. Like, I mean, I, I put everything I can in savings yeah. because I mean, even even when I have a great year, you gotta kind of like assume that the worst could happen. Gonna be that way. <laughs> yeah, the anything. The is gonna happen. go down. You're gonna get squirrels in the roof. Yeah, and you're like, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but like, depending on when my clients pay, I could be shifting tax brackets from year to year. Yeah, it's insane. So you just can't assume that next year is going to be like the last. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. One year I made thirty thousand. One year I made one hundred fifty thousand. One year I made two hundred fifty thousand. One year I made twenty thousand. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you never know. It's like you say when when you're coming up from the bottom, you get used to living. Mm -hmm cheap but you know how much it's going to cost you and so you try and make at least that much you make more than that you don't just run out to the store and spend it all you run, try and keep a buffer so that yeah, it's not coming in and going out and get some dollars so that's how I don't pay your check. Thank you Thank you. Any other questions? How many women do you see like um, doing the work you're trying to do here? Uh, I don't see a lot in more. I mean, there were some key engineers that worked at um, Hit Factory, and um, some definitely it was more women at Quad, but you, it's, it's very rare. And, and definitely in production, I don't see women producing that well. Not enough. I'd be honest, not enough. Like, there is a vacuum of, there's just, it's just all dudes. It just <laughs> is. And I don't think that, I don't think that's good <laughs> at all. Like, I'll say this though, three of the best mastering engineers I know are women. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, a sound designer I know too. I was going to invite, um, we're actually going to throw together a panel I think next year of specifically women just to kind of speak to that point. It's not like there's no women in this industry. There's not enough. There's but, not, um, yeah. But they're out there and some of them are actually top, top notch. I think of like um, Emily Lazar. Sorry. No, Do you think there's a reason for that, like in particular, or? I 
think this just, uh, well, I mean, you guys I mean, when I, when I was in school here, it just I always would say that. Why are there no, no girls in this department? Mm -hmm. Like, they were somebody, like, there's no girls in this department. That's why I'm here. I had to call the other side of campus to see some women. You mean like, you mean like, like, I got English. Well, that's, 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 that's math. <laughs> In my undergrad, my, my first uh, impulse was to uh, do the responsible thing and go into uh, IT. And I got to the department and there were no women. I was like, forget it, I'm going to music. <laughs> so, I mean, at least there were more in music than a lot of fields. And the performers are. I, I mean, guys have the tendency, if there's like a group doing a project, especially if it's a tech project, in my experience, guys have a tendency to be like, yeah, 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 we're all going to figure this out. We'll let you know when we figure it out, like, to the women involved. And I think that's terrible, but like, that's what I witnessed in my in college, like, whenever we're doing a group thing, it was just like, the guys are always going to, you know, do it. And, which is why my wife, who went to NYU Film School, you know, she, there was she experienced that too, and that's why she crumpled up all all the males that wanted the intern and said, "You're gonna hire her." And I was kind of like, well, "What do you mean?" And again, it was awesome. Like it was so good. So I'm happy that there's some women here, but I I don't know why. I don't have an answer to why. Other than I I wish there were more. So, yeah. <laughs> Names you should seek out if you want to write them down would be like Leslie Ann Jones. Um, Emily Lazar, very an NYU friend coming back from Norway, who's also a master's engineer. Oh, you, you, she was at my studio yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah she, she stopped died. by yesterday, yeah. So there's another master engineer. I'm trying to think of a few other names that I know. Uh, oh, Cynthia Daniels. Wow, how did I forget her? Um, yeah, Emily Lazar is a powerhouse. Yeah. yeah. So there, usually you find the women rise to the top of the field somehow. The few that are there yeah. seem to be right in the top echelon. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone else? That's our questions. That's practice. Anything? Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, what advice do you wish someone would have told you when you first started out that nobody told you, but now you feel you should tell someone who's just starting out? <laughs> Buy a video camera. <laughs> <laughs> read the four angles of power. Yeah, read power. I read that. I gotta read that. Uh, Pretty much the networking thing. I think I, I already iterated it. I mean, meeting people is, is much more important than being good. I hate to say it. <laughs> is that it? No questions? Okay. Yeah. Can I take a question? I'll take one more question. <laughs> I mean, we're almost out of time. It's, if you have one, we'll take it. I don't forget. We have to take it Is it all right if. They contact you if they have questions? Yeah, as you say, if anyone's ever in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, oh, you know, yeah. drop me a line and you, you can get my info from him. Sorry, no, this yep. is familiar, but I probably saw you over there. Very, I mean, I'm there every day. Walk, I'm, I got a little Pomeranian, so I'm the guy walking the Pomeranian. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, to speak of branding, like, it's pretty funny, but so my dog is cute and fluffy and very friendly. And every band that comes through, anyone that comes through, I make them take a photo with the dog. And that, that I don't have like a, how am I going to branch myself thing thought out? I probably should. Well, I don't even have business cards. Like, I probably should. <laughs> but like, what you can count on is that you're always going to see photos of my dog with a bunch of like different musicians and artists of some sort. To the point where uh, I had these two bands come from Russia over Christmas. To, they won a battle of the bands in Moscow, like sponsored by Jack Daniels. And the prize was come to New York and record with Eric. So that's what, so I produced these two guys. And they were like, where is Goody? Where's your dog? Like, that was the first thing, and I didn't bring him that day. And they'd already known about my dog, like, in Russia. And to, to wrap it up, <laughs> so people have made, you know, people make fun of that all the time, but I had uh, Dion Warwick in my studio maybe like two weeks ago, because I was filming an interview for I mean, it's funny, this whole networking thing. I did a video for a guy in LA, and he referred me to this other guy that I get an email, can I, can you produce an interview for Dion Warwick in your studio on this date? I'm like, sure. So I, you know, work with the director, how do you want it lit, how do you want it to look, I interview her, do all the filming, and then I get a call from a woman in London that's like, I heard Dion's gonna be in your studio, we need her for another documentary, can you film her when you're done with them? 
So like one paycheck turns into two paychecks, just like that. They're both Dion Warwick, because I happen to have like a nice looking studio that's quiet to shoot in. And so we did the whole thing, and at the very, when there's someone like that in, I leave the dog in the office, because some people have don't like dogs. <laughs> and at the very end of the thing, I was like, so, because I really wanted a photo of a dog with her. I'm like, do you happen to like Pomeranians? And she's like, you kidding me? I've had four. And I'm like, surely you mean you've had four small dogs. She's like, no, four Pomeranians. <laughs> so we spent the next 15 minutes talking about Pomeranians, and I got a great photo of Dia Warwick and my dog. <laughs> so that's my brand. That's <laughs> smart. Yeah. Anything you guys want to leave behind? Any last thoughts? Please tell my students to be on time. <laughs> And then, you know, here's the thing that this is advice I did get that I'm happy I got. And it's from my father. And I've heard him give it to a lot of other people. And I, it's pick whatever you want to do and stick with it. Like, the, the times where you, you ask, like, have you ever wanted to just, like, give up and go do something else? Like, yeah, totally. But because I have persevered, it's all starting to work. And I've essentially been doing this for over 15 years. I'm not that old yet, but like, I've been doing the same thing since I was in high school. And like, I've stayed my path, and now I'm getting good at it, and that, it just takes time. Yeah. It, whole, it takes a long time. I think that, uh, like to that point, if uh, there's that Malcolm Gladwell book where he talks about 10,000 hours, and yeah. like, there's a lot of, outliers, yeah, 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 outliers, there's a lot of wishy-washy stuff in that book, but I think yeah. the 10,000 10, hours thing is absolutely true. I mean, like, it's focusing on one thing, you're, you're dedicating all that time to it, and what the idea is that like eventually you're gonna get a break. I, everyone in this room is gonna get some kind of break, but not all of you are gonna be ready for it. Yeah. But you can be if you work hard enough and then when someone finally comes to you and says, hey, I need you to help me out with this, you're ready. You're ready for that moment. Because you might not get another. The last thing I was saying would be um, to listen to people and not make it about yourself because um, I think people come into the industry with ego, mostly if you feel like you're talented, because I'm sure there's a lot of talented people here, and you have this ego about like you make it about yourself. And I'll give you this example: as a producer, you know, people always ask, "What's your sound?" And I, I, I feel like, and I, when I watch other producers talk about, well, you know, like I do this, and this is my sound, and that actually bothers me because mm -hmm. yeah. I believe as a producer, it's not my job to have a sound. My 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 producer, my job as a producer is to do whatever you want me to do. You know, I'm I'm your tool. You know, so you use me how you want, want want to be used. And so I'm listening to what the person wants. And I think my job is to melt into them. And I think that's why a lot of people enjoy what I do because they're like, oh, how do you already do that? You know, I think that's one of my gifts is that I, I listen to people and I have this, I instinctively kind of know what they want they want and what, where they want to go. And I think I I have I got that gift from listening to a lot of different things, watching a lot of TV and knowing about knowing about a lot of different things. So that's why I say being be inspired by so many things. Like allow yourself to be inspired by anything and listen to people and don't have your ego stop you from being successful. That's, that's it. I'm gonna give a round of applause. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.